And it's like top of mind, right? Women are often like the ones running their family finances and yep. increasingly the breadwinners. So I think the more we can talk about it, the better. Hello, and welcome to Financials Podcast, Future Rich. I am your host, Barbara Ginty, and I'm also a CFP, which is a certified financial planner. And I am so excited to have my guest today, uh, Lindsay Sanvery. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. It's so nice to welcome you back to the show. So for our guests who don't know, uh, Lindsay is formerly a Fortune, CNBC, and Refinery29, where you were in charge of Money Diaries and wrote the book, Money Diaries. So quite impressive. Yeah, it's so fun to be back on your podcast. We haven't done this since I was promoting the book. Yeah, which had to be three, four, five years ago. No, it wasn't. Was it really five? Yeah, five years ago. Yep. Oh my gosh, time flies, especially yeah, with the pandemic. Does. Yeah, definitely. And so you just started a new newsletter. So I would love to chat about that. Yeah. So I recently launched a newsletter called The Purse. I'm actually inspired a little bit by uh, my Refinery29 uh, Money Diaries day. I have been working kind of in the like personal finance service journalism space for a while now. And at CNBC and Fortune, it was fun because I got to talk to a wider audience, but I really miss talking to women about money. It's still a topic that I think is not discussed enough, despite the fact that that book came out five years ago. So I'm using the purse as an opportunity to talk more about um, women and money, but it also now in its very early stages is a lot about the career transition that I'm going through, which was I left my big job as executive editor at Fortune with nothing lined up. So I'm I'm on this big journey to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up, which is a little scary. Yeah, it's always a big move to leave a job without another job. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. I, <laughs> like, like, that's what they tell you. The last time I did it, I was thinking about this as I was leaving was I was in college and I was working for the museum company. I don't know if you remember that. Yes. Store, they sold like, I yes, do they sold, remember that store. They sold like a uh, Van Gogh cutting boards and uh, all kinds of tragedies like that. I worked there for a year and the people were so nice. I actually have some friends that I stay in touch with to this day, but I got really bored and I quit. And my mother was like, you're not supposed to quit a job with another job not lined up. And I, you know, promptly turned around and got a job at Barnes and Noble. So it was fine. But this time there's a little bit more of a lag and there's definitely a lot more on the line than there was when I quit a retail job at 20. Yes, this is a very different, you know, <laughs> child, you're married. But you talked a little bit about in your first newsletter that because you've done such a good job with your finances, it gave you kind of an opportunity to take some time, step away. You know, we'll see where you what you end up doing next. Yeah, I, you know, making this decision to quit my job involved a lot of conversations with my husband. He um, is very careful with our money, which is a good way to be and was, you know, obviously nervous about going from a two income household to a one income. And we've always been really careful with our money. But obviously, like, you know, as you earn more, you spend more and yep. lifestyle creep really happens. And so we knew if we were going to do this, we were going to have to like lean back a little bit mm -hmm. and make some sacrifices, you know, I was going to have to stop buying new clothes for a little bit and things like that. We do have a good foundation. And we sat down with um, we have some financial advisors that we work with, and we sat down with them. And they really helped us feel like, you know, we could do this, at least for a little while, like it can't yeah. be forever. And our big financial goals, like saving for retirement and for our son's college education won't completely suffer, which was a re relief and like really yeah. gave us the opportunity to make that. And that was a really conscious decision, you know, like many years ago, I had been working at Martha Stewart and I got laid off and I kind of went through a similar career transition where I was trying to figure out what to do next. And I took this temp job for a while that I was making a certain amount. But then I got this opportunity to work for this small startup that I was going to be making like a $20,000 pay cut, right? Like, oh, wow. So yeah. huge. And like, we're talking about going from making like 60000 to 40000 So like, that's tough. Like, it's, yeah, it's really significant. But we again, had the savings and were able to do that. And so I'd always told myself, like, it was really important to me that we were careful with our money and had savings so we could, you know, take risks if we needed to. Yeah, I've always said on the podcast that it always looks different for everybody. But I think that financial freedom, you know, is ultimately the goal for most people. And what yeah. that is for everybody is a bit different. But financial freedom is 
having uh, control over your finances so that if you're in a job that you don't like or you want to change or you're in a relationship that you're not happy in or whatever it is, that you're not beholden to something because of the money or because of the finances, that no matter what happens in your life, that you can always say, I need to take a step back and redirect whatever the reason might be. And that's really, truly financial freedom. Yeah, it is. Although you also have to recognize like, okay, but your lifestyle is going to change. Like, yeah, you cannot, can it's not you. You. <laughs> you know, like last year we traveled like crazy. Like we definitely had that like pandemic hangover of like, I need to go everywhere and see everyone. And this year, this summer, like we're, we're not, we'll stay closer to home. Oh yeah. So like some small sacrifices. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, you can't spend like you have two incomes if you have one. Usually, no, if yeah. you have one. Yeah. yeah. If you have one, yeah. <laughs> And also like, right, like that's a huge privilege in and of itself. My husband yep. has a job. He's able to provide health insurance. We're yep. able to get by because of that. It would be so different. I would not be sitting here if I didn't have those things. Yeah, the health insurance is usually, especially for women, I will say yeah. that in my experience, I've never had a man come to me in all the meetings and all the <laughs> classes and all the experiences I've had ever be like, oh, well, I'm not going to have health insurance, so I'm not going to do this. I've never heard them say that. It's always the women who are like, I have to have health coverage because, you know, just a little bit more different from the brain probably making that decision. But yeah, the health insurance is huge because that could be a big monthly number. Yeah, it can be really big. Yes, I know as a business owner because (laughs) the way it works is people do not know. Nobody believes me. I literally have four aunts and a few of them were like, that can't be right. Like, it must be wrong. I'm like, if you can find me a different solution, like I am all ears. I can tell you whatever you need to go research this for me. I would love it if you could find me a different solution. The way it works for small business in New York is in order to qualify for a small business plan, you need 51% participation. Mm. So even though I have employees, their health coverage is better through their spouses. Right. So they don't want to participate. I, I don't blame them. Why would you lose good coverage that you're not paying or you're being supplemented yeah. for to come onto my plan where you're going to get charged through the nose? So I never have qualified in almost 11 years for uh, one year I qualified for a small business plan because of this rule of 51% participation. So I pay yeah. as a solo. So my average healthcare cost has been between uh, 800 and a thousand dollars for a high deductible. So yeah, for just not for a fam, you know, just, one person. Yeah. I advised that there's another advisor who was thinking about going out on his own. He's, I think it's stay at home wife, three kids who are young. So a lot of doctors, right? Kids, yeah. A lot, a lot of doctor appointments. So, so many doctors does not want to be on high deductible. And he had budgeted like a thousand dollars healthcare. I was like, I, I would take 2,500. And he was like 2,500. And I was like 25 to three, depending on your deductible and co-pays, especially yeah. with five people. And he was like, yeah, are you sure? I was like, maybe I'm a little high and you have a little bit of a buffer, but it's better to be high than low. So yeah, healthcare yeah. can be very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so disappointing because you can yeah. think about all of the amazing businesses that would happen in this country if we had better access to affordable health care. Yeah. And yeah, and I will say my premiums, despite this, so there's been an income change. So I'm happy to pay when you make more money. But when I started, sure. my my premiums were the same where they are now. So that doesn't actually yeah. make sense with right. the income increase. That's, that's right. Yeah. So it should have been less to get me into business and gone up. Yeah. As, as you made more. Yeah, it shouldn't have started at that level. We won't fix that problem today. But that is <laughs> no. that is definitely, yeah, beneficial to have the, the health yeah. insurance. And then how has it been? This is something I hear a lot from people when they retire. This is a big transition. When you go from a lot of people, and I do it myself, identify with a lot of their confidence or their who they are yeah. it, affiliated with their job and what they do. I'm 100% certain for me. And so that is something we see when people go into retirement if, have a little bit of an identity crisis because yeah. now they're retired and they're like, well, I don't know who I am or what, you know. Yeah, how is that yeah identity crisis is real. Um, okay. <laughs> I think the hardest thing, I think the hardest thing is uh, introducing myself. You know, I, I live in New York City, so everyone always wants to know what you do. Mm-hmm. And right now I'm like, I'm not sure what I do. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what I do. And, you know, there's, there's a real fear. And I've talked to quite a number of people who, nicely laugh at me when I say this, but there's a fear of like loss of relevance, right? Like I had a really big title, a couple of really big jobs. And like, now that I don't, (laughs) do I continue to matter? 
and I, I've been very lucky. I have an incredible network and some really amazing mentors. And, you know, a lot of people saying, don't worry, you know, you are still relevant. But there's definitely, I think I was at an event a couple of weeks ago with um, Eliza White, who wrote a book about building a personal brand. She talked about this idea of last name syndrome, where you very much identify with like the last place you were. And her claim to fame was that she was the DKNY PR girl on Twitter, which was like a whole big phenomenon in the like very early days of Twitter. And then she ended up leaving DKNY. And that was like her whole brand. So, you know, she had to reinvent herself. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. But I also like, I'm not sure I could have done this younger. Like I'm in my early 40s and I'm pretty secure in who I am. And so that makes it easier to feel confident most days, not every day <laughs> about yeah. who I am or what I'm doing. It's a big adjustment for sure. I would like to thank our podcast partner, AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I drink it literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I wanted a single solution to support my immune system as a busy entrepreneur. I drink AG1 first thing in the morning before I even have my coffee, and it makes me feel ready to take on my hectic day. With wedding planning, honeymoon planning, a wealth management company, the podcast, and a renovation project, I need all the support I can get. This has been the best investment into my daily routine and my health with just one scoop in the morning. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. That's drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. Check it out. But I love the idea of a personal brand because then you're not affiliating who you are with the, the entity, but you're bringing that brand to each place you work and maybe yeah. refining your brand as you go. But yeah, I'm a big believer in having your own brand and not having it necessarily tied to the corporation. Although, but it's very easy when you're at a place for a long time or in a, a certain niche of the industry that that, you know, you identify just with that. Yeah. I also think so that right? Like there's more conversation these days about the fact that like, what do you owe your job? And what do you owe the company yes. that you work for? And you know, something goes, you know, they can decide at any time they don't want to be with you. So I think that, yep. you know, people thinking about not even if you're not like a public figure who's going to be on like a podcast, like making those friendships and networking with mm -hmm. people and doing good work carries over from job to job to job. And I think that's probably a really important thing for people to think about. Yeah, absolutely. The network. I mean, I found that in my career. I'm still very close with a lot of people that I worked with at my yeah. big corporate jobs. Yeah. And it's nice to be able to have someone to call when, when you're not yes. sure, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it's yeah. really nice. So what are you thinking? Like, Oh, what am I thinking? Yeah, it's right. um, <laughs> a big question. It's a big question. So many things. And that's fun. And like, I've really been using this time to just talk to a lot of people to try to figure out what I want to do. I definitely know what I don't want to do, but we don't have to get into that. Um, okay. But I'm really, I'm very excited to continue to grow the purse, continue to figure out ways to talk about women and money, um, you know, looking to freelance write more, do some consulting with businesses to moderate. I really love to do that, to do more podcasts like yours. So it's really fun. It feels a little self-indulgent to try to like do the things I like to do. And I definitely have some like freelance editing projects on the side because I like to have some money coming in that are great, but are not like the Career. dream and the yeah. end goal. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a matter of like figuring out how to balance all of that. That makes sense. So we can do, maybe do a little sneak peek, but we might have something very exciting, a little joint venture coming out between the two of us. Because I was one of the experts for your book back yes. five years ago. And I do think that, and the whole reason I continue to do the podcast is I just don't think there are enough women in finance. And I still mm -hmm. feel like it's a bit of a taboo topic. For yeah, it, I don't know why. I don't know why either. And it's funny because I have a, a really great core group of mom friends here in Brooklyn. And I find we talk about money all the time, like maybe not specifics, but like the cost of camp or like issues that work with salary or, you know, even just like clothes we like to buy and things like that. Like money is kind of always a topic. So I feel like I hear it, but then there's still kind of like a, a little bit of like a, a hang up getting beyond like the bigger into the bigger deeper meteor topic and it's like top of mind right women are often like 
the ones running their family finances and yep. increasingly the bread rent winners. So I think the more we can talk about it, the better. Yeah, I think the more transparent and the more open people are about it, the better. And I think as women continue to be the breadwinner, right? And running the yeah. household finances, I think it's even more important that you take the time to learn it. Because the more you know, the better your decisions are and the less likely you'll be taken advantage of. Yeah, the taken advantage of thing is really scary. And I think that's the yeah. thing. Like we were talking earlier about like men not being afraid of taking risks because they need insurance. Like there's other mm-hmm. risks, I think, and the fear of like getting it wrong. And I think that still exists. Plus, it's like there's always new things. Like I was talking Mm -hmm. to somebody like my money problems at 42 are very different than what they were at 32 and what they were at 22. And as you earn more money, you also spend more money. So I think that that's a really interesting thing to like think about and talk about like, (laughs) how did we get here? And like, where do we go from from here? Yeah, absolutely. And as your life progresses, it can get more complicated. So much more complicated. So like you might nail the the budgeting and the things you need in a more simplified way. And then as your life advances, and that could be at 30 or it could be at 40, depends on who you are and what's happening, but it can get more complicated. And I I think the other thing that I find that I think is there's a lot of now, I think post-pandemic, especially during the pandemic, there's a lot of information online. It's not all sound. So now there's like an influx of information, but you might not want to be listening to that. Like it's good if it like perks your interest to then do your own research. But my concern is just there's so much, and there's the regulators are starting to catch on Mm because the issue that we've had in our industry was if you were not licensed, you were not (laughs) regulated, which was like, right. So it, that's not how it works in under other industries. Just because you're not a, you know, like if you decide to go open a hot dog stand, the restaurant, yeah, yeah. Gosh, what are they called? Um, the food and beverage, the, the yes, city. Yeah. Um, they will come and find you and be like, yeah. you're operating a restaurant. You have to follow right. the rules. You have you to have a license. license. And... You have to have cleanliness. You have to get a rating. Yeah. You can't just say, yeah. oh, I'm not a restaurant. I'm right. not doing food. This isn't a real hot dog. But in finance, if you aren't licensed and you are not operating underneath the constraints of the federal or state governments, you haven't been regulated. So all of that right. information is not being checked and might not be right. right. And right. for the longest time, our industry was like, oh, well, they're not licensed or they're not sure. registered. So we don't check on them. And it was like, whoa, we're getting a lot of these people who don't have to follow any rules. Like the hot dog person, yeah. still a hot dog. It's, you should be making sure it's clean. Like you should be making sure this is sound and nobody had. It's yeah. starting to catch up, I think now. Yeah. And they're all over YouTube and TikTok and Instagram. And it's a lot. Everyone's yeah, a personal finance expert these days. Yeah, they are. And I listen to some of this stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so bad. <laughs> yeah, I feel like right now, like there's still not enough chatter about it. But then what there is a lot of noise in like, who's an expert? But the, the hard mm-hmm. part is like, how do you disseminate what you're seeing and hearing is valid? or sound. Yeah. Yeah. What are the extra resources that you need to find to make sure that you're talking, you know, you're hearing the right thing. So that's another interesting, I think, change from the pandemic. Yeah, for sure. It's been an interesting time with money, stock market growing, going up and different levels of unemployment and everyone on TikTok talking about a recession. I think it's been fascinating when I was at Fortune um, that that became such a hot topic of conversation because I don't remember it you know, from my time at Refinery, that being even a word that people know of. And now I meet people and they're like, so the recession is coming. And I'm like, do you know what that means? <laughs> yeah, it's been an interesting time because that's getting talked a lot about. And then there's, a, I've seen a lot of chatter about like what I will like buying homes and waiting till interest rates go back to 3%. Mm-hmm. And I'm it's like, it's never going to happen. I, I mean, it might when you're 75, you probably won't be buying. You know, usually we start to sell real estate at, at those ages. We yeah. downsize. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, you know, I heard it'll go back to three. And I'm like, "Did no, I don't think so. Not anytime soon, at least. But yeah, the recession and mortgage prices going back up. And the one thing that I think has been interesting is we now have like real rates. So we have like money markets and CDs. And so many people don't know what those are. Yeah. The real rates on the CDs is so crazy. And even mm-hmm. your like high yield savings account. It's, yes. It's nice. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, yeah. It is very nice. It is very nice. But yeah, constant that's been a big change. change. Yeah. Constant change. And then, yeah, now there's a lot more chatter. Not specific to women though, but just in general with the personal finance. True. Not just with women. Although, you know, I think with women, so many left the workforce. So many people I'm talking to are dealing with similar kind of career questions. Mm-hmm. 
even if they're not leaving their jobs, kind of wondering what's next. And we're expected to work until 65, but who knows if that is really what our generation will, you know, we could live longer than our parents. I was listening to a book recently and they were saying that people could be living, you know, into their 120s. Like our generation could easily live into our 120s. And it's like, oh my God. That's a very long time. Yeah, because Social Security, so this is like, we just went on Go Bank and Raise to talk about Social Security and like, Mm -hmm. you know, the concern over that. Um, And so when that was started, uh, was signed into law by uh, FDR, the life expectancy for a man at that time was 63. You collected your benefits at 65. Now, Social Security will say that was not intentional, that the, the life expectancy at birth was 63 but there was a lot of infant mortality. So that wasn't accurate. Mm. So there were, there were people. Interesting. But, so we've dealt with infant mortality. Anyway, you were not expected to live 40 years beyond collection. No. Right. And so no. now when I'm planning people's retirement, you're retiring at 65. I mean, I have to plan at least 30. And, and, pe- yeah. and people will, and that's for a 65 year old today. And people say, well, I don't think I'm going to live that long. I'm like, okay, so let's just play this out. You're 95 and feeling great. And you come into my office and I say, I'm sorry, you were supposed to be gone two years ago. We don't have any money. Yeah. Like that doesn't work. Like that doesn't yeah. work. We have to plan like for beyond for beyond. Yeah. And if we live to be 120, that's, you know, that's another 60 years after we yes. hit 60 that we need to fill. I'm not sure you can be retired that long. Agreed. Yeah. You can't pay in for 30 and then pull out for 60. The the seesaw no. doesn't, it has to be more no. even. It has to be pay in 30, collect 15, collect 20. Yeah. But if it goes pay in 30, collect 60, the math there. Yeah. It doesn't work. So yeah. that's also an interesting component of it. And statistically speaking, women outlive men and the majority of women, this is like not to be sad, but die alone. So are either widowed or right. divorced or single. Men particularly, it's not as high of a statistic. So at some point, women, whether they want to by choice or are forced to, will be yeah. in charge of the finances, whether that's earlier in life that you get widowed or God forbid you get widowed at 80, it's not a great time to figure out the finances. No, which is why you should be involved with it from the beginning. There's a lot of power in that though. It's exciting. Yes, I think so too. And you don't have to be the one doing all the day-to-day work. Like if you're no. married or a partnered, you can, but knowing and understanding so that if God forbid you were in the position to take over, you're prepared to, I think there, I agree. I think there's a lot of power in that. Yeah. A whole lot. And it's not as hard as everybody thinks it is. So it does take time. Like anything else. Yeah. You have to put a little bit of effort into it to be good, yeah. but yes, I could name like a thousand things that I think are way harder than this that are other, <laughs> ad- other adult things that you do anyway. Right. True. Uh, well, Lizzie, this has been so great to have you on. Yeah. It's been really fun, Barbara. I always love to catch up. And for all of our lovely listeners, you can follow us on Instagram for our most up-to-date information. Check us out on Instagram, Future Rich Podcast, and stay tuned. I think we'll have some exciting stuff coming 